Thank you very much for your introduction and thank you for the for inviting me here to present to you the United Nations Framework Classification. Um, I, as he said, as in introduction, he said that I've been working on petroleum for many years, and I've been attached to this uh, project in the UN to develop this uh, classification system since 2001. So it's a kind of addiction to the process and the system. And I give you some insight into this. It's uh, so to say that the classification of resources is the basis on which we develop the policies in which uh, government conduct their resource management, companies do their businesses and capital is allocated. And uh, by the introduction from United Nations, by the Sustainable Development Goals, which you see here, and also on the Paris Accord on Climate Change Mitigation, the way we are doing this is being challenged. We have to do this in a more clever way. And it's true that regardless uh, what we're doing, uh, and none of these goals can be reached without a lot of energy and raw materials. So we have to do this in a clever way because whatever we do, it will have uh, impact on the environment. So we need a, a, we, we need a good uh, uh, resource management system and a classification system which can bring us the uh, information that we need to make uh, wise decisions and to identify the issues that bring the project up to production or stop the project so we can mitigate this. And in this uh, respect, uh, the uh, UNFC meet these challenges. You see a picture of the classification system on the, on the right hand side here. Yeah, this is a red dot. Here it is. And uh, if I should characterize uh, UNFC in, in short, I would say it's a project maturity system. It's looking, it's, uh, it's changing classification from classifying what you have found in the ground to what you will get at the surface when you process this through a project. So it's a project maturity based system. And um, it, the way you classify it is by a balanced view on the socioeconomic uh, factors, which are on the vertical axis, the E-axis, technology on, on the uh, ground axis, the F-axis, and uncertainties, what you call geological uh, axis. And uh, it's also important that the UNFC puts emphasis on figuring in the social and environmental considerations at the center of resource management. And we heard at the opening today the importance of having this social acceptance for doing it. That's a very important issue. And uh, unlike other classification system, uh, UNFC uh, is, uh, is uh, managing tools that takes into account the sustainable development goals. And like United Nations say, that the UNFC will help bring the sustainable development goals to be fulfilled. So let me just uh, show you the update of the uh, domains of applications. In the center we have the classification, then we have the four pillars, the policy making, the resource management from uh, governments, business, <coughs> excuse me, business processes, and uh, finance allocation. And it all started at the, at the very bottom. In uh, 1997, the UNFC for solid fuels and minerals were, were uh, developed for minerals and coals. And then uh, petroleum and uranium were included. That came in 2004. And uh, it started also to include the underground storage for uh, geological storage of, uh, of CO2 and also renewable uh, energy resources and the last one coming in is the anthropogenic resources, the, the uh, recycling of, uh, of resources and not at least water, groundwater management. All these are now captured into this classification and you can ask 
why can all these different types of resources be into one classification? That's because the focus on the project. The project carry information that you need. All other types of information, time series, forecast of production, forecast of investment, forecast of, of cost, etc. So this is a, a very strong uh, um, part of the classification system. Now, <clears throat> in the United Nations, uh, this classification system is developed and maintained by what we call the Expert Group on Resource Management. It changed name a year ago. Before that, it, the name was Expert Group on Resource Classification. But it was a strong argument that, well, classification is good, it's interesting, but you do it for a reason. You do it for managing resources, either for governments or for companies. And, uh, and UN were very interested in focusing on how are we going to do this management the best way. And here you see representatives from the different stakeholders, the governments, the industries, professional societies and associations, financial sectors, international organization, and academia. And all this is gathered in, in the system. And you can ask, why UN? Why should UN be here? Well, UN provides the secretariat for it, and it gives a neutral platform for the process. It's uh, transparent, is inclusive, everybody can, can join uh, if, if you're interested in that. So I think that's a very strong issue around the uh, framework classification. So this is a picture of the classification. And, and it looks weird if you haven't seen it before. It's a three-dimensional classification system. It's a lot of boxes. That's the expansion of it. And uh, you see the different color boxes. They, those are actually uh, showing the different classes. The green one is what we call commercial projects. In other classification, it would be called reserves. And uh, we have the potential uh, commercial projects, the yellow one. It could also be lifted up here. Uh, and we have non-commercial projects, we have exploration projects, not this, uh, where we want to discover uh, mines or, uh, or petroleum deposits whatsoever. This uh, light blue one is uh, in a way outside the, the uh, value chain. This is what is, will be left in the ground when you, you start doing the, the project. And uh, the main thing is to move this up in the value chain to start producing. So you have production, these are the, the pink boxes here, the sales production and the non-sales production, because you always have a non-sales production. And to keep track of that would be interesting, as we heard this morning, because uh, the mine tailings contains also resources when you start looking into it. You are, you are mining for some uh, minerals, but you have a a whole bunch of other uh, valuable minerals left in the ground, which can be mined with uh, more modern techniques, for instance. So let's see how this is built. The, the building blocks are the criteria. And uh, there are three criteria: these economic, social, and environmental viability. We have the uh, field pro project status and feasibility. And we have the geological knowledge. These criteria, uh, each one of them are, are divided into categories like E1, E2, E3, F1, etc. So let's have a look how this looks like. We are looking into the E axis, the economic axis. This is really the strong part of, uh, of the uh, classification is the E axis because what does that focus on? It focuses on the degree of favorability of social, economic, and environmental conditions in establishing the commercial viability of the project. So this um, includes what uh, we have seen before, some of these modifying factors in, in Crisco. It's a consideration of market prices and relevant legal, regulatory, environmental, and contractual conditions. Do we own this deposit? How are the laws? Are there some restriction on the land use, etc.? There are uh, categories, 
E1, E2, E3, where E1 is the best. And uh, here are the definitions. They are made in a plain language. It's, uh, there are no technical terms. It should be easy for everybody to understand this. So what they say on the E1 is that extraction and sale has been confirmed to be economically viable. And for E2, then it's, it's extraction and sale is expected to become economically viable in the foreseeable future. And E3, it's not expected to become economically viable in the foreseeable future, or evaluation is at too early stage to determine the economic viability. So here, the phrase uh, economic viability, here, which is in all three of them is critical one, and that encompass economic in the narrow sense and other relevant market conditions, or uh, including consideration of prices, cost, legal, fiscal framework, environmental, social, and all other non-technical factors that could directly impact the, the project. And uh, this has been very recently used in a successful uh, pilot uh, test in Mexico, where they were looking into different uh, areas where they have petroleum deposits and tried to see how does this fit with the social uh, and, and environmental uh, challenges that we have with regard to population and local communities. And, and they did a very good study on that. And they could use this because of the um, granularity of the system. So let's move to the F-axis, which is uh, the maturity of studies and commitments which are necessary to implement mining plans and development projects. And for minerals, this is typically the pre-feasibility, the feasibility phase, etc. And uh, these uh, considerations, they will extend from the very early exploration efforts before a deposit is discovered or, ac or accumulation has been confirmed through to a, a project uh, where you are producing and at last you are, are closing it down. So there are four categories, F1 to F4, and F1 is the best. And then we have, here we have the definitions. Also here, very straightforward language, no uh, technical terms. Feasibility of extraction by a defined development project. The mining operation has been confirmed as the F1. And then on the F2 is uh, subject to further evaluation. So it's uh, some contingency that we have to solve. It could be technical or it could, yeah, technical. And uh, F3 says that the uh, feasibility ex extraction cannot be evaluated due to limited technical data. So that is very early in the exploration, for instance. For the F4, it's restricted to what is left in the ground when you start uh, doing your project. So, then we come to the G-axis, the geological axis. And that's the, the level of uh, confidence in the uh, geological knowledge and potential recoverability of the quantities. And that reflects all significant uncertainties which are in, impacting the estimated resources. So it's really on the confidence, the uncertainty. And um, in general terms, we uh, in uh, for solids, it's uh, often defined as discrete increments, but for fluids like oil and gas, it will be scenarios like G1, G1 plus G2, G1 plus G2 plus G3. And there are four categories, G1, G2, G3, and G4 is for the undiscovered quantities, and G1 is the best. So. Here are the definitions. G1, quantities associated with a known deposit that can be estimated with a high level of confidence. G2 is with a moderate level of confidence. And G3 with a low level of confidence. 
And for G4, we have estimated quantities associated with a potential deposit based primarily on indirect evidence. So, now it comes to putting it all together. The um, category definitions are actually the building blocks of the system. Um, so the challenge is to select the correct category for each of the three criteria. And you combine this in the order of E, F, G. And then you have a class. So what class 111 means that they satisfy the definitions for E1, F1, and G1. And there are no constraints on, on combination, but when you start looking at it, you will see that not all of them are meaningful, but uh, there's, there's no restriction on, on this use. So, this is just to show how that would work. You have the, uh, it satisfies the E1, the F1, and the G1, and you will end up here in the UNFC class 111. If you have, if it did not satisfy uh, G1, but it satisfied G2, you have to move this ring into this one, so that would be, be the address. And if you always quote in the, in the EFG sequence, you will always end up at, at the same uh, address in, in the system. So, this is uh, how it looks like in a 3D version. Uh, many have problems with that, for good reasons. And uh, since this work is, uh, has been done by um, consensus, it was also a consensus that we, we can use a 2, 2D presentation. Here's that. What you will see here are the, the classes in, in the United Nations Framework Classification, the commercial project that you will have familiar, familiarity as uh, reserves, potentially commercial projects, non-commercial projects, and exploration projects. Here are the categories, the E, the F, and the G. Um, since you have lost one dimension here, you can see that uh, when you look at this potentially commercial project, in some instances you will have a, uh, a situation where uh, the requirements for E1 could be met. So you have the E1, but you have the F2. So it's certainly not a commercial project. Then both E and both F have to be one. And if you're doing uh, project uh, management, then you would need to have a more Detail look, so this is the detailed project uh, uh, classification, uh, saying on, on the commercial projects up here, you have subclasses, say on production, approved for development, uh, justified for development. All these uh, uh, are uh, commercial projects. This one might start producing. This is uh, under development, and this is uh, pro producing. Now, this is the, the blue book. This is essential in, uh, in getting information about it. It's good to have in hand, but you can download it from the homepage of the United Nations. It um, contains the classification, the definitions which form the classification. But it also have what we call specification, generic specification for UNFC. And that is the rules, how to use the, the classification system. This uh, report was published in 2013, and that was the year when you could really start using it, because then you had the, the rules for using it at hand. Uh, another important thing is that you also contain the bridging documents uh, between CRISCO template and UNFC and Petroleum Resource Management System and UNFC. And the bridging document is based on the mapping of the 
the, the other system and UNFC, we tell us about the similarities and differences of the two systems. And the bridging document we give you a guidance on and description of, of how we are going to classify the resources in the other system, being Crisco or PRMS, with the use of uh, uh, UNFC codes. It's an, also an explanatory note to UNFC, how it was developed. And it is available in uh, several languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Thai. So it's uh, globally available, I would say. More languages will come. Um, there has been presented the Crisco template from uh, Heike and also uh, Mikal. Uh, this is uh, the front page of the, the template and this is here, it shows the principal classification scheme. I would just very briefly show how this is uh, bridged to the UNFC without, without going into details. And to do this work, you have to split up this table here. So, and that you will see, we, we keep, of course, the prudent and probable mineral reserves and measured indicated in firm mineral resources. But, so you will recognize it in the next table I will show here. <clears throat> These are the, on the left-hand side, you have a, a reorganized Crisco template, we could call, with a mineral reserve, proved and probable a mineral resource measured, indicated, inferred, an exploration result. On this side, we have the, the classes of the UNFC, commercial projects, potentially commercial projects, and exploration projects. In the middle, we have the, the, the uh, axis, the E-axis, F-axis, and the G-axis. And the main thing here with this table is uh, there's a direct link between mineral reserves, proved mineral reserves and G1, and probable mineral reserves and G2. And the same for mineral resources, direct link here, which means that uh, when we do the mapping, we can forget, uh, we can forget about the G-axis and concentrate about the E and F axis. So, still a small reorganizing here of the Crisco. <coughs> table, you have the mineral reserve, mineral resource, and exploration result. And this is combined with the UNFC subclasses here. And here is uh, noted, this is not, uh, this inventory is not in the template, and uh, this is also not in the template. And there's a color coding here, and the value of that you will see now. We, we have to, to move this and try to map these um, subclasses uh, from the Crisco into the E and F G matrix. Call it like that. And here it is. I, I will not go in details. And, and what, but what you will see here is that when you go from Crisco to UNFC, you have a, what you call a one-to-many relationship uh, exemplified with these blocks here. Some part is falling within uh, uh, the F1 and E2. Some is falling within the F2 and E2. So when, when you then go from UNFC to Crisco, the other way, you, you can see that you have a many-to-one relationship. Now, this is a very interesting effect of the, the system because that means that you, you could be able, if you have made a UNFC inventory, uh, like you see here on the left-hand side, you can report it out into a Crisco template requirements, if needed. 
Um, they are non. Uh, they are not non-safe production in the Crisco templates, and uh, uh, and also quantities remaining in place is not in the Crisco. That's uh, captured in the UNFC. But I think it's this is uh, an interesting view of uh, the bridge between UNFC and Crisco. Now there are <clears throat> several other uh, classification which has been bridged to the. UNFC, and we call them aligned system. The Crisco template I just showed, we have the P petroleum resource management system, and the, also the nuclear energy agency Red Book system. The Russian Federation uh, uh, petroleum resource, petroleum classification from 2013, and uh, very recently also the Chinese uh, mineral resources classification of 1999 and the Chinese petroleum resource classification from 2004 have been aligned system. There has been developed this, this bridging documents. And besides that, we have uh, what we call commodity specific specification, which is important when you are looking into uh, other commodities. Uh, some of them are finished, some are in the process of being made. This is, uh, oh, here it is. the minerals, uh, nuclear fu fuel, petroleum, injection, and geological storage. And for renewables, we have a whole suite. It's geothermal, bioenergy is finished, uh, solar and wind is uh, close to be finished. And they have started uh, working on the hydroelectric and also some on the marine uh, resources. And anthropogenic resources is also finished now. There are some strong uh, regional uh, in initiatives which uh, are in favor of uh, UNFC. In Europe, uh, we have the situation that uh, there are several EU programs which have considered the uh, UN classification and found a great potential in that, which is the Min Future, Rama, Tioera, and Cosminea projects. It's also, I want to uh, put your attention to this, the guidance for application of UNFC for mineral resources in Finland, Norway, and Sweden which was uh, finished last year, and the chairman of the group which did it, uh, Sky Lux, should be in this room. And uh, I have a, a copy of this report here, if you want to have a look on that, it could be interesting for, for you, in your uh, strive to, to have the exploration uh, activities. Um, it, the report is also easily downloaded from uh, from internet. There's a very, very strong incentive from Africa, from the African Union, and they are looking into what they call UNFC for Africa. So they are developing an African mineral and energy resource classification and management system, what they call UNFC AMREC. This is being designed and I think it will be out for hearing later this year. And also, uh, interestingly, uh, they will incorporate the Pan-African Resource Reporting Code called PARC for public di disclosure requirements. Um, UNFC for Eurasia and the Asia Pacific. Uh, I mentioned the bridging of Chinese and Russian classification. And also we see Philippines consider change mineral classification to UNFC and uh, Thailand uses UNFC for mineral resources. India consider update to the latest UNFC, that's for coal. And uh, CCP coordinating committee for geoscience programs in East and Southeast Asia is working to establish a regional UNFC project for its 15 member countries. Latin America, I told about the pilot test in Mexico, and also the uh, association of Ibero American Geological Mining Services and Latin American Mining Organization, ULAMI, are pursuing the development and implementation of a Latin America wide system. Now, I just want to show that 
The system has also been tested in Norway on uh, petroleum resources. Uh, each year we have what we call a revised annual national budget reporting project where all the companies have to report information, <coughs> lot of information relating to the different projects. And that's the quantities uh, in place and recoverable volume, the profiles, production, cost, environmental data, other data, which could be uh, telling the stoppers for project, etc. And all these uh, form the basis for a very comprehensive report from the NPD to the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy and Ministry of Finance uh, for their input to the revised national budget. It's also we populating the information into the regional the database, national databases on, on the petroleum resources. Now, we, there was made a, uh, a classification of these all 700 projects, uh, all in uh, UNFC classification. And uh, since that was done, each time now, uh, four years in a row, uh, NPD published, besides their normal uh, the way of uh, publishing the uh, resource account. They also do it in, in the UNFC classification system and, and they publish these type of tables, which then shows that uh, you have a communication tool uh, through the UNFC. This is the guidance for application for UNFC for the mineral resources in uh, Finland, uh, Norway and Sweden. I talked about uh, just one point before I, I close here. What also discussing the public-private partnership, and um, this is exemplified by a value chain figure here on the UNFC value chain from exploration project through potentially re commercial project into commercial project. And here you see the industry operation, exploration, conceptual studies, etc., construction operation. These are what you have to relate to the mining legislation, exploration permit, application process, environmental legislation, etc., and the planning and building legislation. There's a very uh, bad example from Norway where there's a misalignment uh, of interest here, where a, uh, a mining operation uh, or preparation for that had been started with exploration conceptual studies and uh, at last it was stopped by the zoning plan and the companies had invested 90 million krona and that was lost for the companies and also a loss from the government of course. And uh, the saying was that now we don't want uh, the mines here, this is uh, reindeer, reindeer herding country. <clears throat> So, the um, areas of work for the expert group now will be to focus on developing this resource manage management system, uh, provide toolkits to support the stakeholder and develop the principles, uh, specification, bridging documents, guidelines and protocols which are supporting the project life cycles and um, elaborate guidelines for recognition and strengthening the capacity of competent person, which we heard about from Mikal, but from another perspective, and then to conduct related capacity building, training courses, promotion, etc. And it's about resource management, not volumetric assessment, is how to move a project from one maturity level to another. So, this is a summary. Generic principle-based system is based on the three fundamental criteria I showed, economic, social, field project, theological knowledge. And uh, you could subdivide this and you combine them into classes. So, UNFC will be the core of the United Nations Resource Management System. And I would just end with this, that when you look at a global market, industry and governments benefit from one classification for multiple commodities. 
which is the UNFC. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.